Welcome. I'm Jerry Menikoff, Director of the Office for Human Research Protections within the Department of Health and Human Services. And today we're going to be talking about institutional review boards. And first, I just want to provide a disclaimer that uh, any opinions I express here are not necessarily those of the Department of Health and Human Services. They're just my own. So the goal today is to explain the foundations of the system for regulating research with human subjects. And in particular, the role of committees that are called institutional review boards or IRBs, uh, at least within the United States. In other countries, these are often known as ethics review committees or ethics review boards. And to explain these rules, what we're going to do is start out with a case study. And in particular, the case study is designed to illustrate why doing research is treated under different rules than providing medical treatment. So let's now turn to the case study. And it, it's a case study about an attempt to, to solve or improve a medical treatment for a particular medical problem that involves eyes. And so we're looking here at a, a, you know, a, an illustration of what an, the front of an eye looks like. And I want you to look in particular at the cornea, the very front part of, of the eye here. You could see that. And that's the clear part of the eye. That's the part of the eye that the light goes through. Uh, and the cornea plays an important role uh, in both allowing the light to go through and in focusing the light. Now notice on, on the one side, on the right side of the slide, the cornea is exposed to air, and on the other side, right behind it, uh, there's a little fluid-filled compartment uh, that's known as the aqueous humor. And what we're going to talk about is how difficult it is for the cornea to remain transparent and serve its pro its, its purpose of letting the light go through and letting it get focused. So here we have uh, just a pathological specimen of a cornea. It, I mean, it's usually blown up and actually going from the top to the bottom, it's only about a half millimeter thick. Now let's talk a bit again about how it remains transparent. The top part here is, is the outside, the part that was exposed to the air. And right under it, you'll see there's a little uh, layer called the epithelium, the outside layer. And you'll notice uh, it's several layers thick. And then you have a middle part known as the stroma. And the key thing is the stroma has to, have to, has to have exactly the right amount of fluid inside it to remain transparent. And in particular, if too much fluid gets into it, uh, it's no longer transparent, and it becomes what we call edematous and cloudy. Um, so there's the stroma in the middle. And then at the very bottom, you could see it here, there's actually one layer of cells, and you could actually see the little darker dots there, and those are the nuclei of that one cell layer. And it's interesting, uh, from the time you're born and onward, uh, these cells do not divide. So basically, once you're born, you have exactly the, the number of cells that you're always going to have, except some of them may actually die, but you're never going to have more than that. And these are actually hardworking cells that play an important part in keeping the cornea transparent, uh, because these cells have pumps in them. And what the pumps do is they're, they're busy all the time trying to pump out the excess water from the stroma and make sure it has exactly the right amount of fluid in it so that it remains transparent. And they're very hardworking cells and they have a hard job to do. And now let me show you. So this is just a picture, you know, an, an illustration of what you just saw. And again, you can see the multi-layered epithelial cells on the top and the endothelial cells on the bottom with the stroma in the middle. And you'll note even the, the illustration shows you that the endothelial cells regulate corneal transparency. And that's what we're going to talk about, a problem with, uh, with those cells sometimes. And, and here's an actual photo. Imagine you were really, really tiny, and you were actually in that uh, aqueous humor compartment, and you were looking outward you know, from the person's eye. So in this picture, you're actually looking at that, that layer of, of endothelial cells. And you'll notice um, many of them are, are somewhat small and on look somewhat regular looking with six-sided 
six sides. So they actually ideally should be hexagonal, and that's what they are uh, when you're born and they're all healthy. But you'll notice some of the cells look somewhat bigger and a little more misshapen. And so getting back to what I told you about the fact that um, the number of cells doesn't increase over time. Well, what happens is some of the cells die is that the, the, the adjoining cells basically have to spread out, sort of like an amoeba, and they fill in the gaps. And as they do it, they get larger and more misshapen. And if enough cells die, remember these cells, their purpose is pumping out enough water, enough fluid, and maintaining fluid balance in the stroma. They're not going to be able to do that if enough of them die. And so what happens is you'll get uh, you know, endothelial failure, and you'll end up with corneal edema, and the person won't be able to see very well. And, and that's a pretty serious medical problem, and it happens to many, many people. And we've actually had a treatment for that. And what the treatment is, is a corneal transplant. And what a corneal transplant involves is actually uh, taking a, an eye from a deceased person, and you cut out a, a little round center part of their cornea, uh, what's called a corneal button, because it's about the size of a button on somebody's shirt. And then you make a similar hole in the patient's cornea, and then you plop in the button and sew it in place. And what you're looking at here is what's called a tree fine, and it's just a fancy name for a little cutting device. And you can see you would plop the cornea from the deceased person's eye in that little bowl, and then you'd put the little uh, metal device on the top of it and, and push it down, and it makes the cut of that little corneal button. And this is the way uh, physicians have been treating um, corneal edema for, for many decades, and it works fairly well. And, and so this is just showing you, you know, what it actually looks like. On the left, you have an edematous cornea, and on the right, you have a cornea after a transplant. And what I want to talk a little bit about um, is if you look at the, the right picture, you'll see some sutures there. And we're going to see that actually in real life, often they use two types of sutures. And here you're seeing one of the types of sutures, what are called interrupted sutures. So you'll see there are about 16 of them connecting the, the donor cornea to the patient's cornea. Um, and so these are 16 separate sutures. And again, we're going to talk about those types of sutures and another type of sutures. So what I've been telling you about is what we could call standard care. And we're going to see this is going to play an important role in understanding how we regulate research with, with human subjects. Um, and by standard care, we mean, and, and it can be a variety of different versions of standard care sometimes, but this is the way we generally um, allow certain types of of medical problems to be treated. It's, in general, the, the best or one of the very good ways that doctors uh, treat a particular problem. Now, remember I told you we're going to say more about the sutures. Well, it often is the case in doing this procedure that in addition to the interrupted sutures, physicians will often use another kind of suture. And in this uh, picture, you're seeing that other kind of suture. The others are interrupted sutures. This is a running suture. and Actually, what has to happen here is the physician is using a very, very fine type of suture material. It's really, really hard to see. And in fact, the suturing is actually done under an operating microscope because with just our eyes, you wouldn't actually even be able to see the suture material. And because it's so thin, it's very, very delicate. And so the surgeon has to be very careful as they sew it in. And in fact, if you look at about 10 o'clock, looking at the eye as a clock face, you see that little ball, and that's where the surgeon started the suturing, and they basically went all the way around and came back there, and then they knotted it together, which creates the little ball there. So often, when they're doing this, because it's so delicate, it may be a little tighter in some, you know, some parts of the clock face and in other parts. And the result of that is we end up having what's called astigmatism, and basically that because the cornea acts as a lens, it's an irregular lens, and that causes some degree of blurriness to the patient. So often, in doing this procedure, the surgeon will have both a running suture and those 16 interrupted sutures, or some number of interrupted sutures. And over the first month to three months after the procedure, they'll gradually look at the curvature of the cornea and see if there are any problems in terms of being too tight in some places and too loose in others. And what they'll do to um, improve it is in the tight places, they may cut one or another of those interrupted sutures. 
So that's the way the procedure currently works. Now notice, uh, because of the need to put in all these sutures, it actually can take a while. Not a huge amount of time, but it can take 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and that could add up to a lot of costs because you're in an operating room. And in addition, it could take a few months before the person has very, very good vision. So the result of that is that people thought there were ways to improve this procedure. And what I want to talk about is a Dr. James Rousey, who had a particularly interesting idea of how to improve it. And we'll see what actually happened with his attempt to, to deal with that idea. And here we see Dr. Rousey, and he was showing off there uh, a device which he called the Tampa tree fine. Remember that little cutting device is a tree, pot, tree fine. And if you ever invent anything, it's always good to have a witty, catchy name for it. And he was from a university uh, in Florida, in a city in Florida called Tampa. And so there he's showing it off. And uh, here is... Uh, you know, some a sentence uh, from his patent for this method. And uh, what he indicates is he this is a patent for an invention that would allow doing a corneal transplant in what he felt should be, or hopefully be, a much safer way with far less complications than previous methods. And as he indicated, the, the desire was to do this without the astigmatism and to do it more quickly. And so in addition to all this, it would actually save money and so make it easier in both patients and physicians, the surgeons. And this is a, a drawing of what he was proposing to do. And I know this looks huge, but actually it's just on the bottom you're seeing the patient's cornea, and you'll see in the middle of it that's the hole that was made to allow the donor piece of cornea to be inserted. And floating above it there, you see the, donor, the donor's cornea. Now remember, this is only a half a millimeter thick about. Um, and the new part here is um, if you look at the donor cornea, you could see on the top of it um, these little tabs. And so there are a number of tabs that were added there. And his new tree fine was engineered to allow those tabs to be quickly cut. And if you look at the bottom in the patient's cornea, you'll see these little slits. And basically uh, what he designed is, my analogy is something to, if, if you know, uh, playing with paper dolls where you put clothes on the paper dolls and what you would do is you would, the surgeon would plop in the, the corneal button into the hole in the uh, recipient's cornea and then put the little tabs into the slits. So there's no suturing needed and it could occur a lot more quickly um, than the current standard procedure. And again, since there's no suturing needed, you know, ideally there wouldn't be any astigmatism so the person would actually start seeing better much more quickly, maybe in a few days after the procedure, instead of needing to wait for perhaps months. So that was what Dr. Rousey had in mind, and it was an interesting idea. And what he did with this is he started doing it in cats, and then he began using it in human beings, and he never filed with any type of review committee. Uh, he basically never considered this to be research and never got any research ethics review. And uh, this ended up attracting a fair amount of attention. Here's the way it was described in 2001 in, in a newspaper in the U.S. called USA Today. And it's noting that Dr. Rousey invented this medical device that he thought would revolutionize the way of doing the surgery and make millions of dollars, and it didn't do that. In fact, he ended up losing his job, and it led to federal government findings that he performed unapproved research on more than 60 people. And in fact, uh, the Office for Human Research Protections, OHRP, part of the federal government in 2000, uh, concluded that he had proposed a trial using a, an untested new technique, uh, talked about this at research meetings, and do those in other activities, uh, that agency concluded that he, this was constituted a systematic collection of data, an open label trial, and therefore he was doing research, and therefore he had been required to comply with the rules for protecting research subjects. Uh, and in fact, the office went on to tell the university he worked at that all of his patients had, have been, had to have then been told they were research subjects and they, they underwent experimental surgery. Um, so, so now let me try to put this all together in a way that will hopefully help us understand why we have rules for research.
and why the rules are different from, from care. And what I want you to think about are three categories. Um, so not just the difference between standard care, between treating a patient in, for clinical purposes and giving some kind of clinical treatment. That's the first bullet here, providing standard care. And we talked about standard care for doing a corneal transplant. And then at the bottom, there's the, the research bullet, and we'll say more about that, but research is an attempt by somebody to answer a research question, to not just treat a person, but in particular, to, to learn medical knowledge. And in the middle category, um, I'm proposing a category of non-standard care, and that's on the side of not doing research. It's on the side of, of similar to standard care, but instead of providing a patient with, with the care that we already acknowledge is usually the best way to treat a medical problem, um, a clinician can be doing something that's unusual, that's non-standard, and they may have a good reason to do that. So the first two bullets, the first two categories, are on the clinical care side, whereas the third is on the research side. And we're going to try to explain uh, the differences between those two categories. Now, Dr. Rousey's defense, when they, you know, the government went after him and said he was doing research, he claimed he wasn't doing research. And in fact, he said what he was doing was never used on his patients as part of a systematic investigation. So he was just talking about what the definition of research is and that he didn't come under it. Um, and remember, we talked about these three categories, clinical care versus doing research. And I pointed out that we should recognize this third middle cat category of providing non-standard care. And we're going to, in a moment, talk about how we use these categories to think about why we regulate research the way we do. And as we end this segment, I want, I want to encourage you to think about two questions related to the case study we've been talking about. Why was everyone so interested in proving that Dr. Rousey was doing research? Because that's what the government agency said he was doing. And the notion was that perhaps you had to prove he was on the doing research side instead of that middle, middle category of providing non-standard care to conclude he did something wrong. And so the second question is, well, what if he actually was in that middle category, that he wasn't doing research, that he changed what he did so that he wasn't actually doing research, and he merely told his patients, look, you know, I'm not trying to learn anything new, but I think this new technique is better than the standard one, and this is the best thing for them. Um, is that going to be uh, still a problem, and would the government still be able to go after him? So this is the end of this segment. Thank you for listening. Uh, I hope you found this useful. If you have any questions, please contact the program coordinator.